In July 2016, I was RV camping at Moraine Lake below South Sister in Central Oregon with my two dogs. I planned to summit with the pups the next day and having hiked the mountain before. I wanted to get a couple of miles in to have a better start. After setting up camp and settling into the RV, I finally passed out. Around 3 a.m., I was abruptly awakened by my dog Lily, a three-year-old standard poodle, barking furiously. My other pup, Blue, a four-month, old healer icy mix, was smart enough to stay silent. There was some huge animal running around our campsite, causing a ruckus. I had tied a bag with all our food and dog food off a tree branch about 150 yards away, so I doubted it was a bear. But whatever it was, it was massive. I could tell just by the sound of its footsteps. I quickly got Lily to stop barking, but the animal continued to run around the ERV and the surrounding area until about 4.45 a.m. I sat there with my Glock in hand, petting my dogs for what felt like an eternity, absolutely terrified. The next morning, I couldn't find any tracks, but I was just relieved that whatever creature had visited us left us alone. Just to clarify, the Glock was a last resort. The absolute last thing I want to do is shoot an animal in its home while I'm out on an adventure. For all I know, it could have been a fat deer, but I was prepared for the worst case scenario in case some huge bear decided to mess with us. Even then, I'd try to shoot the ground or something to scare it off. You've got to respect nature or you shouldn't be out there, in my opinion. Anyway, it was terrifying, and I'm just glad nothing else happened. We all made the summit the next day, and it was an incredible experience overall. Got my RV camper tires knifed in the middle of the night. Now that I have your attention, I was camping in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey with wife and dog. We got to the campground during the day and the road down forks to two sides. We're the only people in the whole campground. Later that evening, another couple comes in and goes to the other side. Cut to 3 a.m. Dog is going crazy. We wake up and there's a person standing outside the tent. Go back to sleep somehow. The next morning, a ranger comes by and asks if anything weird happened during the night because the couple on the other side got their temp all knifed up. Gave my camper an inspection and noticed a slash on all tires. Always wondered what was up. Preface. I didn't particularly see anything in this story, so if anybody can direct me to a more appropriate sub, Please feel free to do so. Just a weird incident that happened while hiking. This happened two years ago this summer. Every year in July, my whole family gets together for a big reunion or camp out. We had been going to a certain spot up in the mountains for the previous three years or so. It had just rained really heavy and still being kids is hard. My cousin and I had decided to set off into the woods in search of frogs, salamanders, or any other intriguing critters. As I said, we had been going to the same spot for a while now, so my cousin and I knew the immediate area well. We agreed that our best option would be a small creek just outside of our little campsite. Standing on one side of the creek and looking into it put our campsite directly behind us, and on the other side of the creek there was a very large hill with a pretty steep incline. After looking around for a little while, we had come up empty-handed, and we were just walking around Chit, chatting at that point. He said he had to take a leak, and that made me have to take one, too. So we each find a tree and start going behind our respective restrooms. Just as I started to go, I heard a crack come from up the hill. Not like something or someone stepped on a twig. I mean a thunderous crack. If you can imagine a giant man uprooting an entire pine tree and breaking it over his knee. That's what this sounded like. And it was not a gunshot. I have been around guns and have hunted for the better part of my life. This sound was not a gunshot. 
This was an unmistakable sound of wood snapping. I peek my head around my tree and find my cousin looking right back in my direction. His expression was one of pure fear and concern. Probably the same face he saw looking back at him. Was that you? He asked, no, that wasn't you. I replied, no, simultaneously. We both scrambled to get the hell out of there. And I know that you're never supposed to run from a bear, but we didn't care what it was. In our panic, we just wanted to get as far away as possible from whatever it was. We made it back to the campsite just fine. To this day, I can't confidentially say what it was. I'd like to say it was a huge bear, just to justify my irrational fear of them. But logically, it could have just been a right place, right time situation, and a tree had broken just as my cousin and I were standing there. Regardless, scared the shit out of both of us, and we still laugh about it to this day. I've been seeing some really freaky stuff out at my uncle's ranch outside of Flagstaff. I should probably preface this a bit. I'm very close with my uncle, and my parents were, let's just say, unable to properly take care of me when I was in my teens. So I went to live with my uncle for a few years until I turned 18. Things were pretty normal for the most part. However, at night, things seemed to take a turn for the worse, and it only progressively got worse. This is actually kind of hard for me to type out, because I know a lot of you probably won't believe me. But I didn't believe this stuff either until I saw it with my own eyes. There were a few times at night when I would see bizarre things, evil things. Sometimes there would be these weird lights in the sky far off in the distance, accompanied by weird noises. Everything from screams to house bangs and booms. Sometimes I would hear weird banging on our house and windows while we were trying to sleep. I remember one night specifically, I uh, woke up to the horses freaking out. Something had spooked them. My uncle was gone at the time, so it was my job to tend to things when he wasn't there. I was only 16 at the time, so I had to man up real quick and grab a flashlight to go see what was going on. As I was making my way to the stalls, I practically screamed in terror as I saw what I could only describe as a ten-foot-tall bear-looking thing run off in the distance. It almost had the face of something that would resemble a bear. It had a snout, but it was hunched over with its arms and hands curled closer to its body. Yet it was running on two feet. It was dark, and this thing moved so fast I couldn't get a really good look at it, even though I can give you the above details. I also noticed that it had unusual eye shine. Actually, I would say it had more like an eye glow than anything else. I remember I screamed out loud, What the co-expletive was that? I quickly made it into the stalls and the horses were freaking the hell out. I spent some time trying to calm them all down and eventually got them calmed down. Enough to go back to the house. It was almost three in the morning. I was so freaked out by the whole ordeal, I wasn't able to just fall right back to sleep. I kept hearing weird noises off in the distance, and what sounded like heavy thudding that would come close to the house and then stop, as if somebody with huge boots sprinted right up to the house and then just stop. I'm really not sure how to describe it. There have been other times we've seen a weird blue light off in the distance and weird noises that happened at the same time. I remember another time when my uncle was home, and this happened to be in the evening when the sun was setting. I remember sitting in the living room with my uncle, and this weird, pale-looking face popped up in the window, staring at us. It didn't have a nose, but did have sharp teeth and weird, reptilian-like eyes. I froze in terror. My uncle jumped up, grabbed his rifle, and bolted out the door. This thing disappeared. I sat there, gritting my teeth in total anxiety and utter silence. It wasn't long before the silence was broken by my uncle's gunshots and him screaming. I knew I had to go help, so I got up, and before I could make it to the door, he came running back in, slamming the door behind him and locking it. He was bleeding profusely from his left arm. 
I couldn't tell if he was clawed or bitten, but what I had to do was go run and tear up a shirt to use it as a bandage to stop the bleeding. It was that bad. I remember asking him if I should call 911, and he quickly told me not to, that it was a waste of time. Things had subsided after that, and the rest of the evening calmed itself down. It was later revealed to me that he's been having weird issues and things showing up on his property long before I'd ever shown up there. He's called 911 and the police out there before. Of course, they're never able to find any evidence of such things happening and have threatened to arrest him and detain him again if he calls 911. One more time. The typical not me, but, but it was quite interesting. A friend of mine was hiking alone, and when it got darker, he noticed someone behind trees watching him. It was a literal Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th, he said. He was a huge two-meter guy with wide shoulders, the mask and fitting outfit, and also a machete or axe. Don't remember what my friend exactly said. He got stalked for some time until he had enough and went back home because he was really creeped out. Sure, it was mostly someone pulling off a prank, but I wouldn't feel comfortable hiking and camping when someone is following me in a Jason costume. Wasn't on a hike at the time of the occurrence, but I was in my tent camping between hiking spots and I heard a rustle at about 2 a.m. A little ripping noise and maybe like some leaves breaking. We kept our backpacks next to our tent against a tree and it seemed like maybe someone was moving my bag. So I zipped the tent open getting ready to yell at someone who was looking through my bag. There was a huge bear's ass just right in my face, and his face was in my backpack, munching away on some leftover food I forgot to put in the bear can. So I zipped that shit shut and laid back down, trying to think of a happy place. It took about an hour before the noises stopped and he left. Almost shit myself, to be honest. Back in the 80s, I was camping with some high school friends deep in the forest about 10 miles down this old logging road. We were far away from anyone and anything and drinking around a campfire. We were fooling around when suddenly we heard a massive, loud and deep roar, howl, scream from the forest. It stopped all the fun dead in its tracks. We didn't want to drive because we'd been drinking, so we put the fire out and spent an uncomfortable and sleepless night in our cars. Back then, there weren't supposed to be any bears around here, though I had seen one on, on the other side of the county a few years before, but I've never heard a bear make a noise like that. You could tell by the echo that it wasn't very close, but it was so loud it sounded close. It wasn't anything like the typical roar of a bear more like a high-pitched scream or howl with a huge bass rumble underneath it. The echo seemed to last forever. It only happened once. I know we didn't drunkenly imagine or exaggerate it because we had a boombox and were recording us telling each other jokes. The roar was so loud it distorted the microphone on the boombox. A while back I ran into the guy who owned the tape. We were both still mystified about what that could have been. And sadly, his basement flooded years ago, and the cassette was ruined. A few years ago, my husband and decided to go camping at campsite in the Ozarks. There was a private camping area near a couple of cabins you could rent, and someone with a permanent home on site. I've always had creepy experiences in the woods and rarely sleep, so I foolishly thought I'd sleep better near other humans. I also decided to take an edible that night to help me sleep, but I ended up staying awake with anxiety instead. My husband is a sound sleeper. Meanwhile, I hear every sound. It was probably about 2 a.m., and my husband is sound asleep, sawing logs when I realized all has gone silent outside. 
There had been a lot of normal forest noises, armadillo walking around, deer, etc., but now it was eerily silent. The next sound I hear is a tree falling down. It sounded huge, loudly crashing. It wasn't anywhere near enough for me to see from my point, but I definitely heard it. I should also say that this at least the third time I've been in the woods and either seen or heard a tree falling down, and once a lone tree in the middle of the sunny woods was raining. It's weird enough when it happens in broad daylight, but this was creepy. Uh, no other noise afterward. Eventually the forest noises returned. But you can bet your ass I never went to sleep. The next day I tried to look around for it, but the property we were on bordered private land I couldn't hike on and never did see where it might have been. I realized nothing really happened, but I couldn't help thinking about the old question. If a tree falls in the woods and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? One day in the late 90s, I think it was in the summer, my ex and I took my young daughter hiking on a semi-remote trail in the neighboring county. The trail was all wooded and terminated at a small creek. There were no other cars at the trailhead, and we passed no one on the way to the creek. When we arrived at the creek, we let our daughter play in the water a while, then headed back up the trail the way we had come. About halfway up to the parking lot, we found the upper half of a fawn in the middle of the footpath. It looked as if it had been cut in half with a cleaver, but there was no blood on the ground and no footprints of anything or anyone other than our own from when we had first come through, and all the organs and what was left of the body were intact. Then we heard barking, and a dog went through the trees up ahead as if it was chasing something. This has disturbed me ever since it happened. I can think of no reasonable explanation. If it had been a mountain lion, there would have been a clean cut and would have been consumed. Also, why was it placed so neatly and bloodlessly in the middle of the trail for us to see? I live in central Missouri, and this incident occurred on an arm of the Devil's Backbone Trail in western Callaway County. I love to hike. I've done several parts of the Appalachian Trail as well as many other trails. I've run across weird people and creepy signs plenty of times, but there is one spot near where Boone, North Carolina, Tennessee, in Virginia, meet that I hiked recently that really scared me to death. Nothing happened. I mean, it wasn't a sound or person. It was just that spot. I was just filled with a dreadful feeling, and the air seemed to be sucked out of that spot. My hiking partner felt it, too. I don't know why, but it felt like we were going to die right there if we didn't leave at that very moment. We got a move on and did not look back. The weirdest thing is we didn't talk about it. It's been three months now, and if I bring it up, she changes the subject and won't discuss it. So I'm just left with this weird feeling. I will say I'll never hike that area again. It actually crosses another area I've biked called the Virginia Trail, a wonderland for bikers and a bike trail I highly recommend. Just don't go up the part of the Appalachian Trail that bike path crosses, because that spot is about one half miles up from the crossing. It's just an evil piece of ground. I have never gone camping or out into the woods at night after this trip. A few friends and I had a long weekend, five days off from school, and we decided to go camping in the North Georgia mountains. We packed a big ten-person tent. There were five of us, two guys, three girls, and loaded up my buddy's truck. He and I had some experience being outdoors, camping, hiking, or hunting, and he's an army vet. So we packed really well and had all sorts of amenities like a propane stove or grill, fold-up cots, portable shower. We were in it for the whole weekend. We left Wednesday afternoon and parked the truck in a small town and started hiking into the woods to find a spot. It was a fairly normal hike until we got about four, five miles in. 
The first time we noticed something strange was when we came into a little clearing in the woods with a big pond or tiny lake in it. We stepped into the open area and everything stopped. No birds chirping, no squirrels running around. Even the clouds and wind seemed to stop moving. My buddy and I both thought, well, shit, there's got to be a predator nearby and took out our handguns. It's the law in Kennesaw, just in case. I've never seen a bear in Georgia, so we figured it was a mountain lion or maybe some coyotes. My friend and I were looking around the edge of the clearing, and he grabbed me. He nodded across the water, and when I looked, I saw what seemed to be a woman standing just at the tree line. She was maybe 150 yards away. We assumed she must live somewhere nearby, and so we continued walking past the water and clearing. As we headed back into the woods, I looked over my shoulder at where she was standing, but she was gone. The sounds of the forest returned once we got into the trees. We made a campsite about two miles past that as it was getting late and we didn't want to be stuck building camp in the dark. We got everything unpacked and set up and built a fire, popped a couple beers and sat down to hang out. There was a girl I was interested in on the trip, and we had been flirting, so after a few beers and the sun was down, we snuck away from the fire under the pretense that she wanted help setting up part of the tent. We started fooling around, and after a few minutes she stopped and looked at me funny. I asked what was wrong, and she said nothing. It just got really quiet. We both quickly dressed and headed back outside to the fire. The others hadn't noticed anything strange and didn't mention anything wrong except joking with us that it took us a long time to fix the tent. On the first morning, we found that the propane stove had been turned on, not ignited, and had gone empty overnight. None of us had used it. The second morning, we noticed some things had gone missing. A lantern we left outside by the fire was gone. My crush's sweatshirt she left on a little folding chair or stool. We figured we'd just misplaced things or someone had used them and put them somewhere else. During the second full day, Friday, we were looking for a waterfall that we read online was in the area. We were following the river upstream when everything went silent again. My buddy nudged me while we were walking and indicated up to the top of a hill next to the river. I looked up through the trees and was just able to make out the figure of the same woman, same clothes and all, just standing. I couldn't tell if she was looking at us or not, but she was just standing there. My buddy told the girls he thought he saw a mountain lion following us and was going to go scare it off. He hustled up the hill, making a lot of noise, and came back about ten minutes later. He said he scared it off to the girls, but told me aside that the woman wasn't there when he got up there. We found the waterfall and put it out of our minds as the girls decided to skinny dip in the river and titties can solve anything. We hiked back to camp and found it a mess. It wasn't totally trashed, but it was clear something had gotten into our stuff. We told the girls it was probably raccoons. We both took our guns to bed with us. That night shit went sideways. I remember waking up because my crush was squeezing my arm. We had been sleeping cuddled up together. I opened my eyes and she hushed me before I could ask what was wrong. There was complete silence all around the tent. I looked across the tent and my buddy was sitting halfway up looking around. We both stayed awake for the next two-ish hours until the sun started coming up and then packed our stuff and we all headed out. The entire hike back into town was eerily silent. There were a couple points I thought I saw the woman through the trees but never got a clear sight of her. We avoided the lake completely and got back to the truck in what seemed like half the time it took to get out to the camp. After we were safely on the road back home, the girls and my buddy all started to tell everyone about moments they thought they heard or saw the woman all weekend but were too freaked out to mention it out loud like she would go away if we ignored her. The wild part was none of us could describe her face. It's almost like it was blurry. No idea who she was but I've never been camping or hiking at night since. My best friend and I, both female, went to go camping to France when we were 16. We bought a ticket for the train. We live in Germany, 
And since we didn't have a lot of money, we figured we'd just find spots somewhere to camp in the wild since we did this at home all the time. We grew up in a really, really rural area. So off we went, slept a few nights at train stations or guarded beach bars, very nice people helping us out, until we reached a smaller town right by the Mediterranean. We set up our tent on the beach, and a storm was coming in. We tied the tent to some concrete pillars for garbage cans so it wouldn't fly into the ocean. There was an older guy watching us while he was fishing. He waved at us, and we waved back. Didn't think anything of this. Went to go to sleep at nine or ten, while the storm got stronger and stronger. In the middle of the night, my best friend woke me up by quietly poking me. She whispered, there is someone outside the tent touching me through the fabric. We both sat up, took our knives out, and just froze. There was someone poking through the tent and brushing against it. After a minute, I said, duck it. We'll open the door or zipper. Guess he was outside. That fishing guy. He tried to tell us that there were apparently rats eating the food we left in our pot outside. That's why he wanted to wake us up. We asked him why he's still there in the middle of the night. It was like two in the morning by then. He said he's meeting his friends to go night fishing. It was storming and raining at this point, so that was a fat lie. We lied to him and told him our parents are at a hotel in town, so he thinks we were going to be missed when he kills us. We untied the tent from the concrete and started packing up our shit. We just wanted to get away there. He didn't try to touch us, he just watched us and told us his friends were going to be there soon. So we hurried up and the tent got ripped away by the wind and flew into the ocean. So there we were, two 16-year-old girls. No tent, almost no money, and some creepy guy on a lonely beach in the rainstorm. We just packed the rest and bolted. He didn't follow us and his friends never showed up. We found a spot in the town surrounded by walls like a little patio, so we stayed there until the night was over. Tried to find a hostel the next day, couldn't find it, took the next train home. Duck this. We wanted to stay for two weeks, made it to four days, and I had my period. It was the holidays of my dreams. At the beginning of September 2014, my husband and I, along with our 26-year-old son and his pit bull, were camping in the Laurentian Mountains in Quebec at a campground called Camping Lausanne. It is close to a national park. I knew there were a few reports of Bigfoot sightings in the national park nearby. We had been camping in our 32-foot Winnebago there for two days, and everything was going well. It was a weekday, and there weren't many other campers on the ground. Before bed around midnight, my husband had to use the bathroom, and instead of using the camper bathroom, he went to the public bathroom. He was gone for at least half an hour to 45 minutes. I started to worry about him, but I didn't go looking for him. It was quite dark. I asked him not to wander around at that hour in the dark of the countryside. He had stopped to smoke a cigarette outside the campsite washroom, then slowly made his way back to the camper. He got back at about 12.30 a.m. At about 1 a.m., everyone was sleeping, and I was in bed reading. Out of nowhere, there was a loud thump on the side of the camper. The thump was very loud, and it hit right beside the window on my side of the bed. The camper rocked like it was pushed. It rocked three times and stopped. It scared the hell out of me. No one woke up, and the dog didn't bark. I quickly woke my husband and whispered to him what had happened. My heart was pounding from fear. He's a hard sleeper, so he said he didn't feel a thing. The window is about eight feet above the ground. Whatever hit the side was tall and strong enough to rock the whole camper. I turned out the light so I could see outside. Slipping the curtain aside carefully, I looked out the window and saw nothing. My husband said it was probably the wind, but there was no wind at all, and it was quiet. It was completely dead air. He then said it was probably a raccoon. If it were a raccoon, I'd have heard it rustling around, and Hal would have reached up beside the window to bang on the outside wall. 
I'm not stupid and have camped my whole life coming across many raccoons in my time, as well as deer and fox, and once even a bear. My husband went back to sleep after checking things and looking outside the door and the windows. There was nothing there. And he admitted there was no wind at all and it was dead still air that night. Approximately 20 minutes later, there was another hard, loud punch or bang on the Winnebago outside wall. Again, in the same area, about eight to nine feet off the ground. And it actually rocked the camper, and my husband sat up in shock, and it kept rocking the camper, probably about ten times. My husband asked, why is it not stopping? And then it stopped. I don't think I've ever seen my husband scared like he was that night. He wouldn't even open the camper door to inspect outside, and he closed off all of the lights. He admitted that it wasn't the wind. Then he said it could have been a raccoon, but how could it reach the window, and why would it bang on the camper like that? We talked and rationalized for a while after another hour of waiting to see if it would happen again. We went to sleep. We couldn't figure out why there were no sounds of hooves, if it were a deer breaths and snorts from a bear, or rustling from a raccoon foraging around for food. It was dead silent, no footstep sounds. No rustling grass or leaves, no foraging noises, nothing. Then we thought, why didn't the dog bark? I kept listening and listening because we had the window open, since it was pretty hot out but we decided to close them in case it was dangerous. We thought it could have been people trying to scare us, prank us, or rob us, so we locked everything and closed the windows and blinds. We didn't have any more occurrences that night. We stayed for two more nights. Nothing like this had happened again. It was just that one night. The next morning we were telling our son, and I texted my brother, who is an avid Bigfoot researcher. He had contacted you alone. You gave him advice to give to us, which was basically to leave the campsite because all of these were classic signs of a possible Bigfoot encounter. We didn't leave, but the next morning I tried to reach the spot outside the Winnebago where it was banging and being rocked. I'm five foot four and I could not reach that height even on my tippy toes and with my arms outreached. So it was about eight or nine feet high. Then I tried to rock the camper the way it was being rocked, and I realized I couldn't even budge it, so I asked my husband to give it a try. He couldn't do it either. It wouldn't budge. Whatever rocked the camper was very strong, strong enough that while I was in bed, my body was swaying back and forth like I was in a boat on wavy waters. So I think that cancels out the possibility of it being another camper playing a trick or a raccoon. Still, if it were a deer, we'd have heard it trampling around a little, and a bear makes noise too. It was so quiet, eerily quiet. When we discussed it again the following afternoon, my husband admitted that it was unusual and it certainly wasn't the wind. I think that since he went to the bathroom so late at night, he could have been spotted by a Bigfoot and followed back to the campsite. It shook the camper to get us to come out and possibly abduct or harm us. We were both pretty shook up. We won't camp there again. I wanted to write to you earlier, but of course fear of being judged and not believed. We didn't tell anyone and left the campground feeling like we experienced something unusual and fearful, yet there wasn't much we could do about it. There were no tracks and nothing was out of place the next morning. Even though we had left things like dishes and our lantern, an ashtray on our campsite picnic table, and nothing was disturbed. United States Army Air Crew here, flight medic. On a long cross-country flight in a Blackhawk, we touched down at some no-name airport to refuel and use the toilets or smoke or whatever. While I was standing outside the small building next to the flight line, we all distinctly heard screaming and shouting at the edge of the airfield, way in the distance. Too far for us to dash to and be useful, so we finished fueling and spun up to climb up and sweep the whole angle that we heard the commotion. We all heard it and we all heard it from different places, so we were all interested. 
We swept the area with INVGs, and finally the old spotlight. Nothing. Even if it had been a prank, we would have found the guy doing it. Unless some clever deadhead put speakers out there in the middle of unaware, there was nothing that could have made that sound. It took moving 1,000 miles away to finally feel comfortable enough to tell you this story. This happened just before my senior year of high school over a period of three weeks in the summer. I was 17 years old, drug-free and sober. At the most, I took Abel for headaches every now and again. I just want to assure you I was not on any mind-altering substances or long-term medication that could affect my cognitive ability. During the summer, my curfew was 11 p.m., and this occurred while driving home from my, at that time, boyfriend's house, which took roughly 15 minutes, so let's say about 10. 45 at night. I was full of energy at this age and a night owl, so I was not even remotely tired. In fact, I was hyped up with the warm summer nighttime breeze, car windows down, singing along to the radio. I took a shortcut through back roads to avoid going into the tiny city with its jerk cops. Also, one of the roads I took was super straight and flat, so I could really speed, and that feels great when you're a teenager. But right before that road, I had to take two very close turns to get onto it. First, I'd take a right turn that was more than 90 degrees, almost back the way I had came, then in an exactly half a mile I would turn left onto the long straight road, where I could really put the gas pedal down. Since it was only half a mile, I normally didn't speed up that much because the small stretch of road was more like packed gravel. It would be a waste as I would have to slow down again to turn left onto the much better road where I could let loose. The tiny property on the inside corner of the left turn is where all this went down. A house had recently been built there, two stories with a detached garage, and it seemed odd how quickly it had been erected as we built our family house, and it took us a year to finish it. I will start at the beginning because I believe this is all related. Week 1 I am positively jamming to my music. The wind whipping through my car feels great, and I'm relaxed in my very familiar drive home. I slow down to make my right turn onto the rough rural road, just be bopping along when my lights illuminate something stunning sitting on the corner of the road. It's a wolf, a real wolf, a solid white real wolf. I know the difference in my dog breeds and a wolf. I love watching dog competitions, wildlife documentaries, and have even met a one-fourth wolf in person. They look different from domestic dogs. This was a wolf, and it was amazing and blowing my mind. I slow down even more while I turn down my music. I'm getting close to it, and I notice that it's not minding me at all. It is sitting perfectly still on the corner of the road, staring at the house. Almost unblinking, its ears didn't even flick towards me. All its attention was focused on this house. I was so close I could have reached out my window and brushed the fur on the back of its head. I was smiling and amazed, but my mind was already churning. It made no sense for a wolf to be behaving like that, even less, for there to be a white wolf in rural North Alabama in the summer. I came to a complete stop behind it, marveling at its fur and presence. I felt euphoric like I had seen something rare and blessed. My mind made a jump to the local Indian stories of animal spirit guardians, and I started to wonder. I couldn't stay, though. Mom would never believe me if I told her I was late because of a spirit wolf. With a sigh, I said goodbye to the wolf and drove home in a better mood than ever. I got to see something special, and it filled me with emotions of joy and peace. Week 2 I was driving home again, and I had been taking extra care to keep an eye out for my wolfy buddy hoping to see him again around that area, so I drove extra slow with my window down and radio off. That was a horrible mistake. I should have realized what the presence of a guardian meant. It meant danger. Alas, I was on the short road approaching the new little house. 
Then I saw the thing that to this very day makes me question my sanity. My reality and possibility of eldritch terrors as Lovecraft described. It was crouched right before their mailbox. Its limbs folded and pulled in tight with its hunched posture, yet its head was still taller than the box. It was mottled green and black with undertones of blue, and it looked wet and slimy all over. Its head was elongated, allowing for an extended maw full of razor-sharp teeth. The upper half of its body looked emaciated with barely more than frog-like thin skin pulled over angular long bones, ropey muscles to hold it upright, and at the end of its grossly stretched arms were equally terrible long fingers. While its legs had bulked to them and looked equipped for running, with back, facing knees for sprinting, and tipped in raptor-like curved claws, it looked tall, maybe seven foot, maybe more, just folded up into this predator's posture, waiting for prey. Then there were its eyes, solid, black, and sunken. I still want to vomit thinking about its eyes looking at me. Then I realized, it's going to look at me? It's going to see me, and there's no avoiding it. Tannic terror unique to this alien thing swallowed me instantly, feeling like I was tilting off the world I had always known and into an abyss where monsters like this exist. I couldn't breathe, but I had to get my window up. I had to get my window up or I'd be ripped by those teeth and torn with those claws. Blood would adorn the cabin of my car and I would become an unsolved mystery. I had a manual crank window. F me. I had a crank window because I was scared of crashing into water and not being able to get out of my car. But now I realized that there were far worse things in the world than crashing into water. Its head was turning towards me and I had let off the gas, but I was still getting closer to it. It made me want to scream, but I had to get my window up first and I was cranking it as hard as I could. I was starting to cry as I finally got the window closed and then I put my gas pedal to the floor. Gravel road, be damned. I thought I must not look at it as I pass. I must not look at it or make direct eye contact. I just shouldn't. It's not good to connect with these things. I've already seen too much. My tires had found grip and I started to launch forward, passing it. In my peripheral vision, I could see it starting to unfold its limbs, and it sent a terrible chill down my spine. I'm screwed. I'm really screwed, F. I was mumbling through my tears as I slid around the turn, fishtailing for a moment before I rocketed down the road. I felt sick. My heart was hammering. I had snot and tears rolling down my face and my hands were shaking. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could only see darkness as there were no street lamps out there. I used a trick I've mentioned in one of my other stories to tap my brake soft enough the light comes on, but I don't actually slow down. Red lit up the dust that was billowing up in my wake, but amidst the swirling chaos I thought I saw a darker shadow than the rest, a tall, thin shadow. I had enough and decided I was going to drive straight to the lighted roads and not let off the gas again the rest of the way. No more looking back, I was going to drive 109 miles per hour, which is as fast as I can go before my governor kicks in. I even ran a stop sign at the end of the road because I was not going to get caught by this thing if I could help it. I took a right onto the highway and flew home. I might have even been relieved to get pulled over, but I did not. When I got home, no one was awake. I was pretty trusted to come home on time, so I called my boyfriend and cried to him for a long time before I was able to explain. He was dismissive and thought I was pulling a joke on him. Then he thought I was just being crazy and seeing things. There's many reasons we didn't stay together, but his insensitivity contributed. Week 3 I refused to take my shortcut anymore. For that reason, I would have to leave my boyfriend's house a bit early, and he'd been making fun of me about it all week. One of the days, we went to a park to walk around, and on the way back, he decided he wanted to drive by the house where I saw that thing. I was hysterical begging him not to drive there, but he would not be dissuaded, so as we got closer and I could not stop him, I leaned my passenger side seat all the way back and pulled myself down. 
cowering in panic of getting near the place. I hid below the window and covered my eyes while panting heavily, reliving the traumatic night in my mind again. At one point, he stopped the car. Spooky, you have to see this, he said. No, I whined, resisting him, pulling at my arm. No, you really have to see this. Look, he said in a changed tone of astonishment. Tears in my eyes, I uncurled and slowly peeked over the rim of the window. The house was gone, burnt clear down to the foundation with only a handful of framing beams still standing. The ground around the house was blackened in a perfect large circle. My boyfriend started to get out of the car. I shouted, No, let's get out of here. Well, I grabbed for his arm, but he easily avoided me and got out. He walked around the ashy piles of the ruins for a bit, using a stick to poke at this and that. When he finally came back, he had an intense look of thinking on his face. There was no evidence of any personal belongings, furniture, power wiring, or even interior walls. It doesn't seem like other burnt-out houses. Something's weird. When we got to his house, he searched for news articles about any house fires in the area. There weren't any. He called the closest fire station and was quickly brushed off by the person that answered as they didn't know about a fire there and didn't have time to find out before quickly hanging up on him. I never wanted to see that place again. I went out of my way to avoid the roads in that area. Talking about it still makes my chest tighten, my skin crawl, and my eyes water. My brain still has trouble because I know I saw it a thing that is nothing like any creature known to humans. Yet still, I saw it. If you've heard of something that matches its description, let me know. Edit, this is near Moulton, Alabama. Saw my neighbor's eyes for the first time. I-20, seven female, have interacted for the last year and half with my neighbor and her husband, but mostly her. I met the wife first as I used to take my son outside to play. And she would always come outside to have a small conversation. I did stop interactions with them both as they started asking for too many favors that I no longer wanted to do. Well, today, after not seeing or hearing from either of them in like three weeks, she asked me for toilet paper and a ride to the bank, which I refused as my car is currently not working and was going to decline either way. I did offer some toilet paper, and as I handed it to her, I looked her straight in the eyes and her pupils were slit. Now I've made eye contact with her in the past, but never noticed this until today. This also isn't my first encounter with someone with slit pupils. Back in high school, when I was a junior, and this was about 11 years ago, I went up to my gym teacher to let him know I wouldn't be in class the next day as I would be attending a funeral. He was wearing sunglasses, and he took them off as I was telling him, and lo and behold, he had slit pupils. What's even weirder when I look back, I noticed all the gym teachers would wear sunglasses indoors. So yeah, second time in an 11 year span, I've seen two people with these types of pupils, and I know I wasn't seeing things. Anyone else have a similar story? Last summer, 2023, I quit my job as a professor. We rented out our home and used that income to move into the woods of Southern Oregon. My husband has a good job, and I freelance. One of the ways I contribute to the household is by working as a camp host three days a week in the RV park we live in, in exchange for free rent and utilities. I usually just make reservations, but it means I get to spend some time outside talking to others. There have been a few spooky events happen that I wanted to share. First of all, the mysterious flute playing. Our park is in the middle of nowhere woods. A small hill towers over us on one side, covered with impenetrable trees, and a river is on the other. At least three times a week we hear what sounds like a flute or recorder playing for an hour or so at a time. Sometimes it comes from the deep woods, sometimes from the river. 
I brought it up to a resident who has been here since 2004. She strongly advised me to ignore it and not mention it. Next, a scraping sound at night. About once a week, I hear a scraping sound dragging along the ground through the park towards the deep woods. My husband has heard it, but no one else. Interestingly, the park ring alerts me that someone is standing in front of the office when I hear this sound, but the camera doesn't pick anyone up. Because I hate the ring going off when cars drive by, I have it set to where someone needs to be standing on the office porch to generate an alert. Next, a late night caller. We regularly get calls after dark asking us for a space for the night at the last minute. I take their credit card over the phone and use a map to direct them to a space without leaving my trailer. The park owner explained that she didn't want me to help any late arrivals after dark. In fact, she make it a strict rule that we're not allowed to answer the phone at all between midnight and 6 a.m. I was told that camp hosts need to be careful about who they invite into the campground. Then other random things occur. I'm in charge of selecting long-term residents if we have any open spaces. I review criteria such as applicants' job size and age of their rig, etc. While children are welcome to visit the park for short stays, no one with kids is allowed to move in on a monthly or yearly basis. The owner hasn't ever given me a real reason for this. The park was built by a woodcarver. There are massive and strange-looking totems, sculptures, carved doors, etc., all over the property. This all being said, our park is a slice of heaven. I love taking my dogs to swim in the river, wild mushroom gathering, and listening to the sound of the rain with just a thin roof between us. Also, I feel very safe here. I'm becoming more open to the idea that the woods can just be weird in some ways I don't always get. I wonder if there is something unexplained going on here, or if it's just our imagination. About two or three years ago, I was with some friends in my car outside one of my friend's houses. It was around 9 p.m. in wintertime, so relatively dark out but clear weather. There were five of us in the car myself and a friend in the passenger seat, as well as three friends sitting in the middle row. It's an SUV. We were talking about some random topic when all of a sudden I felt an intense feeling go down my spine, like we were being watched. I turned to my friend in the passenger seat, and he looked up at me at the same time, like he had just seen a ghost. I asked him if he felt that too, and he said yes. None of my other friends in the back felt anything. We felt really strange, but ignored it and kept talking. A few minutes later, the feeling came back stronger than before, and once again, my friend and I looked at each other at the same time. He looked right past me at the driver's side window, which my back was to, and told me not to turn around. None of my other friends saw anything, but he said there was something out there, and I felt some sort of presence behind me. We took turns describing to each other what we sensed it looked like, and we were for sure both seeing or sensing the same thing. It was pure white and humanoid, but the details of what we sensed are fuzzy to me, clearer descriptions later in the post. After a minute or so, it went away, and we were totally spooked. This is where it gets weirder. My friend and I had both felt the presence making circles around the car, and we began to both see green glowing circles moving quickly around it. It's hard to explain. But we couldn't really see them. It was more knowing they were there. They began to move faster, and we were freaking the hell out. Then all of a sudden, they disappeared. Once again, we both saw or felt these, but nobody in the back did. Then, passenger seat friend and I were leaning back to talk to the middle row, when all of a sudden, on the sidewalk behind the car, there was a flash of white light and a creature sprinting down towards us. It was pure white, bipedal, somewhat humanoid, and very tall and lanky. I'm going to guess it was probably seven feet tall. It had a horse-shaped head, long black thin hair, black eyes, and claws. My friend and I in the front screamed simultaneously, started the car, and got the hell out of there. 
Once we were far, far away, we once again took turns describing to each other what we saw, and we were both on point with each other's descriptions. I took everyone home. Then, as I was driving home, I still felt the presence behind me. I couldn't tell if it was in the car or not, but whenever I got to a stop sign or light, I felt it catching up. So I sped the rest of the way back. Once I got home, it was gone. Both my friend and I could sense that whatever it was wasn't there to kill us or anything, just to make its presence known. Nothing like it has happened before or since. The only relevant connecting factor between the passenger seat friend and I, that those in the back did not share, is that we were both Christian at the time. Any ideas as to what we could have experienced? I can get in touch with the passenger seat friend if needed for extra info. Thanks, everyone. About four years ago, I was with a friend driving late at night. We wanted to go stargazing, so we always went to this one spot where there were huge acred ranches on a dirt road. The nearest houses were quite far away from the road. We stop the car and get out for a moment. Something doesn't feel quite right, and I tell my friend this. He doesn't notice anything, but agrees to leave. As he's turning the car around to go the direction we came from, I see this creature run across the road from one bush to another. It freaked me out because it was huge and flesh-colored, almost like a man crouch running somehow, but it seemed too lanky and weird to be a man. Certainly way too big to be any kind of animal I know of. I only saw it for a second. I asked my friend if he saw that, but he had his head turned and we were already driving back at that point. I've thought about it ever since. Oh boy, my family has a lot of stories, courtesy of my mom. Back in 80s South Africa, she and her friend got into playing glassy. Glassy? Which is similar to Waja, but without a board. It was all fun and games until they started communicating with something that went by the name of Zippo and claimed to have been a murderer in life. Zippo only wanted to speak to my mom, and they didn't take it seriously asking ridiculous questions. Over separate sessions, Zippo grew aggressive, saying awful things that my mom refuses to elaborate on. She firmly announced that she would no longer talk to him. The glass they used spun around aggressively, traveled down the length of the table, and fell off. Moments later, a crucifix fell from the wall. My mom never played glassy glassy again. It's worth noting that this all happened in a house that had previously been used by the town mortician, who would lay out bodies in body bags on the lawn. My mom still has nightmares about that house, and she believes there was something very, very wrong with it. Another incident from South Africa during the same time period involved my uncle. He had been out drinking with friends, and they decided to drive home. I'm told road safety and rules were more lenient, almost non-existent, in Essa then. As they were driving, he had a premonition that they would die in a fiery car crash. Although he mostly brushed it off, he asked to be dropped off on the side of the street and walked home. The next morning, the police arrived at the house and informed my grandma that my uncle had died in a car crash. My grandma replied that, no, he was asleep in bed. It turned out that his four friends had indeed died in a fiery car crash, some burning alive and pleading for help from bystanders who couldn't assist them. If anyone's interested, I have a few more stories I can share. So... Let Cyril's continue with other stories. Back in the 1960s, my grandparents and my baby aunt moved into a small house in a nice neighborhood. My grandma soon started feeling extremely anxious in the house. She would stand near the front door every evening, peering through the kitchen window, waiting for my grandpa to return from work. She clutched their Doberman guard dogs for safety and kept my aunt next to her, asleep in her pram. One night, with both of them at home, there was a knock at the door. 
but my grandpa found no one there. The dogs were with him, and they reacted with their hair standing on end. They both heard an elderly woman's voice repeatedly calling out my aunt's name, and the sound of high heels moving down the hall. It was my great-great-grandmother's voice, even though she was dying in the hospital at the time. In the same house, they hired a gardener who would take care of the property while they were away. When they returned, he took my grandpa aside and told him that he had encountered a man in the living room, leading to a physical altercation, but then the man had vanished, poof, into thin air. My grandma only learned about these events years later when my grandpa finally shared the story and revealed that the estate agent who sold them the house had disclosed that the previous occupant had hanged himself in the hallway. In my own story, which took place about 20 years ago in England, my mom and I were living in a horrid 200-300 year old cottage on a dairy farm which was completely isolated and felt like it was miles from civilization. It gave me the creeps, and I always felt as though I was being watched from outside. Like my mom in her previous house, I also experienced nightmares about this one. Anyway, one day we heard a loud crash from downstairs and rushed to the living room to find a painting that had been on one wall standing up against the opposite wall. My cat, who was absolutely petrified, had the hanging wire from behind the painting wrapped tightly around her neck. All right, I have goosebumps and chills now, so I'm calling it a day. DTA remembered more. During the same time in England, my mom, aunt, cousin, and I developed a habit of taking late-night drives. One night, we were driving through a quiet village at around 12.30, 1.30 a.m. when we drove past a peculiar elderly woman who, as ridiculous as it sounds, strangely resembled the stereotypical witch. She was very slim, had a sinister smile, a prominent nose, and was using an umbrella when there was no rain. We all shrieked and were so shocked that my mom quickly reversed to check because we couldn't believe our eyes. There was no sign of the woman, and there were high walls on both sides. I guess it's plausible that someone was out to scare people and escape through a narrow passage or something, but we couldn't spot anywhere she could run to. My uncle managed an old pub. One day, my aunt heard commotion in the kitchen, and when she entered, the curtains had been pulled shut, and a broom was in the middle of the kitchen table. On another occasion, my cousin and his friends heard the glassware in the kitchen, shaking violently for minutes on end. While not paranormal... This next one is definitely horrifying. My grandparents had another gardener who was caught stealing and subsequently fired. The gardener promised to curse them. Soon after, they returned home and discovered various muti, traditional magic, items in the garden, and their three guard dogs had been brutally killed. It was not the last time their dogs were killed, either. What can I say? South Africa was hell. My mom once dated a guy whose mother had an intense dislike for her. The mother resorted to obtaining items from a Sangoma witch doctor, believing they would protect her son from what she considered my mom's malevolent influence and keep her away. She found them in his car, and, well, they definitely did their job in the end. This isn't paranormal or that scary. Before we left as a in the late 90s, we moved into a house which had belonged to an older lady who had been murdered on the premises. This property was a few houses down from my grandparents, and I remember her having been a sweet, lovely person. I never felt a presence or any darkness in that home whatsoever. The awful thing was that blood spatter remained on the veranda and could not be removed. Her killers were never apprehended, and that did play on my mind. It was just my mom and I alone. In the house, we'd share a bed and she kept a knife under her pillow. My cousin slept over and woke up to someone knocking at the window. She peeked behind the curtain and found a man staring back at her. It was Christmas 90, 8, and the whole family had spent the day with my grandparents. We drove the short distance back home, pulled up to the fence, and saw that the house was being ransacked by at least five men. They fled before police arrived. I was only terrified that my dogs would be harmed. 
Not long after, we were packing up boxes and getting ready to emigrate. I was playing near the front fence, and a man called me over to tell me he was going to murder us. Yeah, bloody hell, that was an essay and a half. Hats off to anyone who reads all of this. I grew up in southern Georgia in the woods and swamps, hunting and hanging daily. Fast forward 20 years. I'm on my lease hunting property near Whitmire, South Carolina. I found it strange that the old guys in the club would never ever hunt alone in these woods. I normally carry a .36 while in the woods. One evening it was getting late, 20 minutes or so, maybe before dark. I'm watching some small ponds sitting over a road in the tall pines. I'm in my climber maybe 10 feet or so up in the tree. I love the woods but hate heights. The woods are loud, but then very quiet. Okay, I thought. I was just hoping for a big buck. The next thing I hear is someone walking towards me in the small pines. But then they just stop. It's getting really dark. I start hearing deep groans where the walking had stopped. I'm thinking that it was a bear or a cat, which would be very uncommon in this area. A big cat, maybe. But bears this far south is not normal. It gets very quiet again. I could see the small road well in the moonlight. The next thing I hear, the groans are immediately under me, almost beside me. Now the groans are becoming growls. Also, the odor was a bit overwhelming, just like a dead animal in the woods. I thought that a stinky animal was climbing on my tree and felt like I was going to be grabbed. I started moving a bit, trying to get my gun pointed down and lifting my feet. I was shaking because I was freaking scared. I could hear heavy breaths. I started yelling down. If you're a club member trespassing, I don't care. Just identify yourself, or I'm gonna freaking start shooting. I thought someone was trying to get at me in the tree stand. I never heard another sound, and the foul odor was gone. I put my gun on my back and started slowly climbing down the tree. No more than two or three steps down the tree. I smelled that awful odor again. Then I heard a low groan. It was right in front of my face, but it was so dark that I saw nothing. It scared me so bad I stood up and jumped into the dark in the other direction. When I hit the ground, I rolled around, jumped to my feet, and ran down to the road. I ran as hard as I could to the gravel road where I could see well in the moonlight. At this time, I remembered that my buddy was down at the bottom of the road in the small pines where I put him in a big box stand. I didn't see his light, so I had to run down that road to get to the bottom by the rivers. He was down by the rivers. When I ran up to him, he said, Man, there's some weird shit going down. We need to go. We slowly walked together back up toward the gravel road. I heard someone walking on both sides of us all the way. I think my buddy was hearing it too. We didn't speak during the entire walk, maybe five to six hundred yards for some reason. I didn't feel my gun was going to help. I had hollered earlier, threatening to shoot, and whoever this was, they weren't scared. When we got to the gravel road, the entire atmosphere had changed. It was almost 11 o'clock at night by then. My buddy didn't talk much. We went back to camp and had some food. We went to bed. I could hear him rolling around all night, and I didn't sleep a wink. I've been a park ranger for over a decade, and in that time I've seen some incredible things. But nothing could have prepared me for the truth about what was really happening in the national park where I work. It all started when I noticed that there had been an unusually high number of disappearances in the park. Hikers, campers, and even other park rangers had vanished without a trace, and despite our best efforts, we couldn't find any clues as to what had happened to them. That's when I started to notice something strange. My supervisor and some of my colleagues seemed to be hiding something from me. They would speak in hushed tones when I was around, and I could sense that they were holding back information from me. Finally, I confronted my supervisor, demanding to know what was really going on in the park. That's when he revealed the truth. There were unknown predators in the park, creatures that were preying on hikers and campers and even other park rangers. 
I was shocked and horrified by this revelation, but what really terrified me was the fact that my colleagues had been keeping this information from me. How long had they known about these creatures? And why hadn't they done more to warn people or protect them from harm? I knew that I couldn't keep this information to myself. I went to the media and shared the truth about what was really happening in the park. But instead of being praised for my bravery, I was fired from my job as a park ranger. Now I'm on the run, pursued by the very people I used to work alongside. But I won't stop until the truth about the unknown predators in the park is exposed. I know that it's dangerous and that these creatures could come after me at any moment. But I won't rest until justice is served and the innocent people who have vanished in the park are given the answers they deserve. And I am John, a seasoned park ranger. I know these woods like the back of my hand, or so I thought. One day I received a call that changed everything. A murder had occurred in the park, and no one knew who did it. When I arrived at the scene, it was clear that no human could have committed such a heinous act. The victim's body was mangled, and deep claw marks were etched into the ground. As I began to investigate, a feeling of dread came over me. I knew that something terrible was lurking in these woods, something not of this world. And then I saw it, a creature unlike any I had ever seen before. It stood over eight feet tall with razor-sharp claws and eyes that glowed like fiery embers. Its breath was hot and putrid, and its movements were quick and precise. I knew I had to catch this beast before it killed again. But as I pursued it deeper into the woods, I realized that I might not make it out alive. The predator was nowhere to be found, and I was getting frustrated. I knew that if I didn't solve this case soon, more lives would be in danger. I went back to the scene of the crime and found a small scrap of fur that looked like it belonged to the predator. I sent it to the lab for analysis and waited anxiously for the results. When they finally came in, my worst fears were confirmed. The predator was a genetically modified creature that had escaped from a nearby laboratory. I immediately contacted the lab and informed them of the situation, and they sent a team to recapture the creature. But the creature was too strong and too smart for them. It outsmarted the scientists and managed to escape yet again. I knew that it was only a matter of time before it struck again. I spent every waking moment searching for the predator tracking it down through the thick underbrush and deep into the heart of the park. As I closed in on it, I knew that this would be the moment of truth. Would I be able to stop it before it killed again? With my heart pounding in my chest, I came face to face with the creature. It was enormous with razor-sharp claws and teeth like knives, but I was determined not to back down. I drew my weapon and prepared to fight for my life. The creature lunged at me, and we engaged in a vicious battle. It was like nothing I had ever experienced before, but I was determined to come out on top. In the end, I managed to take down the predator and save countless lives. As I stood there gasping for breath and covered in blood, I knew that I had made the right decision to become a park ranger. I had protected the park and the people who visited it, and I had proved that even in the face of great danger, a single person can make a difference. I was walking home from fishing, taking a different trail, as I got about two third roads. Up the hill I had the hair on my neck stand up and a feeling like I was being watched. This was around 5 p.m. I just casually kept walking till I got home, always checking my back. It happened again within a week, maybe a few days. Did not smell anything, cause I had been fishing or no smell anyway wasn't long afterwards I was checking on the clouds of a thunderstorm when lightning struck close to the trailer. By this, I mean I had my head out the door. I heard a yell about 70 yards behind the trailer. It didn't sound like a cow, but I checked anyway. No cows had been in the area for at least six months. The scream was high-pitched without coming down a lot at the end. With my wife being there, I just closed the door and didn't say nothing. I would say the following Sunday afternoon, my wife went to church at 6 p.m., and I stayed home to watch TV. 
about 45 men. Later, I was laying on the couch watching TV when something had blacked out my window at the far end of my trailer. The window was one feet wide and three feet tall. I'd raised up to look out my picture window above the couch and it turned the corner and walked around the steps at the back door. It was looking off into the woods and as it kept walking it looked at the ground. Understand this though, I had clear plastic on my window to keep heat in from winter. He hadn't taken it down yet. When it got to the window, I'd already laid back down on the couch, looking up and lay still. It looked down at me and kept walking, hopefully. I laid there for about as long as I could stand, maybe a minute. Then I got off the couch by sliding on the floor. Went and got my gun, walked back in the living room and waited a minute, then went outside making all noise I could. I checked the back of the trailer, nothing there. Details of Bigfoot is as follows. He was about seven feet tall, maybe seven feet. Three, solid black, no white or brown that I could see. Remember the plastic. His head was more rounded and not cone-shaped. I could not see the color of his eyes or anything like that. He was broad-shouldered and thinner around the waist than what you usually see in the pictures, and he walked more upright, not humped over like a gorilla. His hands hung around his thighs. The next morning, around 10 a.m., I got up from bed as I worked second shift then. My wife told me a friend of mine had come down to see me. I asked what did he want. She said she only saw him as the top of his head went across the kitchen window. We had to set the trailer on four blocks high and three on the other end, which meant you could not see anyone walking in front of the trailer, not out the kitchen window anyway. I told her my friend was six feet four and with a hat on. You could not see him the way she had told me. We lived on rocky ground, but I had one dusty dirt spot at the end of the trailer, hoping he had walked in it. I checked, and in the middle was a footprint. It was about twelve and a half inches long, and three and a half to four inches wide at the heel. Being dust, it was only one-fourth deep. There were only three toes, which I did not understand at the time. I told some friends at work, and one came to see it. The following Friday or Saturday night, he and a friend of his came over, no drinking sorry, and I told him the whole story. My friend was not hard convinced but his friends started talking big. So I told them, let's go outside, joking around to see how brave he was when we heard two dogs about medium to small size started barking and chasing something on the other ridge behind my trailer, which was not far at all, maybe 200 yards. They chased it into the small valley about 50 yards, south of us. When one dog quit barking, the other gave one more. Then it was quiet stunned. We looked at each other and Bigfoot started running back towards us. It stopped about 80 yards from us and started to hit a tree with something that sounded like a branch about four to five inches thick. Then it ran closer to about 40 yards and done the same thing again. By this time all bravery was gone. I went back in the trailer and got my gun. Come back out and ask if anything had happened. The brave guy thought he might have seen something in the shadows south of us light was on, of course. They took the gun away from me, and I didn't mind, thinking I had a way of escape, but we heard nothing else. My nearest neighbor is about 250 yards away, mother-in-law, no one else for at least a mile. No reason to mess with us that I could even think of. That was the last I've seen or heard of him. I have been a park ranger for over a decade, and I have spent countless hours in the woods, but nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered on that fateful day. I was out on a routine patrol when my radio suddenly went dead. I tried to retrace my steps back to camp, but the dense forest made it impossible to find my way back. As the sun began to set, I realized I was lost. Panic set in as I realized I had no food or water, and the temperature was quickly dropping. As I stumbled through the underbrush, I heard something rustling in the bushes ahead. I froze, waiting for whatever was making the noise to reveal itself. After a few tense moments, a massive creature emerged from the foliage. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, towering over me on two legs, with fur as black as midnight and eyes that glowed in the darkness. The creature let out a low growl, and I knew I was in serious danger. 
I tried to back away, but it was too fast. It lunged at me, its razor-sharp claws slashing through the air. I managed to dodge the first attack, but the creature was relentless. It chased me through the forest, its deafening roar echoing through the trees. I was sure I was going to die, but then, as I stumbled through the underbrush, I saw a glimmer of hope. In the distance, I spotted a faint light. I knew it was a ranger station, and I knew that was my only chance. With all the strength I could muster, I ran towards the light. The creature was hot on my heels, but I could hear it slowing down as I got closer to the station. Finally, I burst through the door, slamming it shut behind me. I was battered and bruised, but I was alive. The creature had disappeared back into the woods, and I was left alone to process what had just happened. In the days that followed, I couldn't stop thinking about the creature that had attacked me. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, and I knew that no one would believe me if I told them what had happened. But I also knew that I had survived and that I had a duty to warn others about the dangers that lurked in the deep woods. I never forgot the terror I felt that night, but I also never forgot the resilience and strength that helped me survive. But I grew up seeing shadow people, white shadow people too. When Slender Man got popular, I immediately thought of some of the things I've seen here. There was some sort of entity that would harass the little girls who lived here. Nothing horribly obscene or anything but my sister used to complain about a figure that would walk around her bed at night and say mean stuff to her. Like it would walk back and forth and call her string bean an ugly little ginger bitch. By the way, after my sister was telling me this all upset and shit, I actually laid off of teasing her for being a ginger for a couple years. It made me feel really bad. Anyway, she said she could never see its face or anything, but its outline was like the Grinch from the old Christmas movie. She'd always complain about it, and my older cousin, also female, chimed in while she was talking to me about it and said she had the same thing happen to her when she would stay here. They both agreed that it lived in a hole in the air between two oak trees that just refused to grow, an area my sister refused to play. Those oak trees have been the same size since I was probably five years old and I'm 33 now, still the same size. Keep those trees in mind. It gets weird about the trees. So shortly after my friend moved out, about a year later, my girlfriend and her daughter moved in. After about six months, her daughter started complaining about the same thing. She was scared to tell us at first. She would come in and wake us up, and we figured it was just her being scared of the dark. She was around six at this time. One morning, while we were getting her ready for school, she started quietly telling her mom about it. Could tell she was embarrassed and didn't want to talk about it. I was making coffee and it stopped me dead in my tracks. I stopped and squatted down to talk to her and smiled to try to ease her worry and got her talking more about it. She straight up called it the Grinch like that was its name. She said it just walked around her bed saying mean stuff to her. Never touch her or, or anything. I asked what kind of mean stuff and she said he walks back and forth and he says bad words and calls me fat piggy and dumb little girl. In other words, I'm not supposed to say, freak me out super bad. Started texting my sister about it and would have contacted my cousin too, but she is estranged from most of the family at this point. So my sister and I talk about it, put up crosses in the house. I put up some Norse protection runes, salt at the doors and sage the house. It apparently subsided after that, so one or all of those worked. When I was walking her to the bus stop for school a couple months later, she pointed at the area between the two oak trees that won't grow and said, That's where that stupid Grinch lives. Ha! Can't get me any more stupid Grinch! And then she threw a rick at the trees. It was pretty funny, but I got concerned again and started asking her about it. She said she was fine and she hadn't seen him in a long time. I'm assuming since I took some precautions and used warding of various types. So I asked what she meant by him living between the trees. She told me he lives in the air between them, like when we watch Stargate. 
So trying to get more answers before the bus comes, I ask her how she knew that and if she could see him right now. She looked back at the trees and said, No, he's not here right now. He only comes out at night because the sun makes him invisible. So now I ask if I could see him if I tried. She says no, only girls can see him and you're a boy so you're not supposed to see him. And then the bus came and we kinda dropped it after that. But ever since then I've got weird unexplainable knocking on windows, particularly when I'm in the shower. My girlfriend at the time, the girl's mom, and I split up several years ago and I still get the window knocking and weird noises. I'm used to it now because that's just life here. It's always been weird as hell. Saw Greenman's face once when I was a kid. Weird piece of property we've got here. Lowell edit. So for further reference, my girlfriend's daughter never met my cousin and never talked to my sister about stuff like that. So it's not like the idea was planted in her head by them or anything. Later on, when talking to my sister about it, she told me that maybe it's because she's getting older, but as time goes on, she has forgotten more and more about it. She said she doesn't even remember it having the outline of the Grinch anymore. She remembers calling it that and knowing that it looked like the Grinch before, but doesn't remember the outline. She used to be able to go into detail about it, but now all she vividly remembers is the ginger bitch part. And maybe that's due to growing up, adulting, and prioritizing memories, but she's 35 and I'm 33. I remember these conversations vividly because it freaked me out so bad. I am 20 and me and my buddies enjoy late night walks on the trails within the various conservation areas in my region of southwestern Ontario. Late last week week we decided to check out an area called Pleasant Valley. To my knowledge this area has a deep rooted history with the Underground Railroad, indigenous peoples, as well as the War of 1812 if I am not mistaken given its proximity to Lake Erie. We entered the woods at about 2 a.m. and immediately upon entering, I was overcome with a bad feeling, and after walking for some time, the feeling progressively worsened, until we reached two bent trees and an X over the path. My one buddy pointed out the fact that it's bad juju to go underneath and we should just call it a night, as we all felt watched. As soon as we turn around and start to head back, the entire forest seemed dramatically quieter. We all hear a loud, distinctively human whistle behind us, almost like how you would call a dog over. There is no way anyone could have been out there at that hour, and there is no homes in close enough proximity for someone to be out and about. We all ran, and I was honestly terrified, me, and my friends are all relatively big guys, and we are all comfortable in the woods, so it takes a lot to get us running low. Any ideas? Hello, what a people thing this thing was. A demon goblin something else. Why was it in my house? This took place in a suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota around 2015. My father was a police officer for 30 years. He is a respected member of the city council and an all-around reliable dude. He told me that a few years back he walked into the bathroom late at night to get ready for bed and a four-foot-tall demon thing was standing on the bathroom rug facing him. He didn't feel scared, but sensed that the creature was just being annoying. It had long arms hanging almost to the floor and had brown fur, but wasn't super hairy. He said it had a bat-like face, but not quite as smooshed. His first reaction was to say, in the name of Jesus, leave my house. He said it just kind of stared at him, then jumped up and vanished through the closed bathroom window. No broken glass. End of story. This happened in the summer of 2020 in Lawrence County along Blaine Creek in eastern Kentucky. My mom's home, where I grew up, is situated in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains. There are no houses or neighbors within half a mile of her house. The area is simply beautiful mountains. One night her old dog was barking, whimpering, and growling. He just wouldn't stop acting up. 
My mom was confused since there were no outside noises that she herself could hear. The dog was pacing back and forth to the door and windows. After 30 minutes or so, she decided to grab her flashlight and go outside to make sure everything was okay. No animals had been messing with her trash cans, so she figured her dog was picking up the smell of a raccoon or other nocturnal critter. She scanned her yard and the creek and didn't see anything out of place. So she turned to go back into the house, and that's when she saw it. I will give the best description that I can from what she told me. I've never seen it myself and hope I never do. She said it was standing on its hind legs. These hind legs looked like an animal's, but the front looked more human. It had patches of long, light-colored fur all over the body and legs. The top looked like a humanoid man, while the lower part looked like an animal. The face was very odd. She called it an alien apeman. She said that it stood about seven feet in height and was muscular. She stood paralyzed with fear, shining her light on it. It looked at her. Then it started walking on all fours out of her yard, towards the back and toward the mountain. It did stop and look back at her a few times, but finally disappeared into the darkness. There was another encounter. One night, a few weeks later, her dog began acting up again. She decides to stay inside. She turned her lights off and looked out of her dining room window. There was a pole light in the yard. She was able to see it again, although it was further away from her and not as detailed. She said it had the same shape and was the same thing she saw just weeks earlier. She backed away from the window for a few minutes, then looked out again. It was gone. After that, she would walk out onto the back porch and fire her shotgun at dusk, hoping the creature would heed her warning. It's been over two years now, and she still fires the shotgun every early evening. The creature hasn't returned. I had just gotten up from sleeping and was putting on clothes for the a.m., fishing with my friend. I was standing and looking out the upper bedroom window and saw a large, grayish-brown, hairy figure trotting through the edge of the woods towards the log cabin and turned to trot across the earth dam. I immediately went downstairs and asked my friend if he was attempting to play a joke, but he was already down at the boat in another direction. The figure had been jogging or trotting at a moderate pace with a hunched-over stance, and I witnessed it for six to ten seconds before it disappeared across the lake. I am a Marine Corps veteran from Vietnam, and I have better than 20-20 vision I have been on many fishing trips in the area for about ten years. When the figure was moving through the tree area, it looked as though it was brushing some of the limbs with its body. I was driving back home from my friend's place in rural western Minnesota around 1-2 a.m. I was driving through this area that's about three-fourths of a mile long that's just a long canopy of dense trees. Dark even in the day, but at night it's pitch black. You can barely see 20 feet in front of you, even with high beams on. Anyway, driving about six feet away from the side of the road 100 feet ahead of me, I see something that looks wrong in a way I can't explain. You know when something doesn't make sense to you, or you know something isn't right. Like the parasympathetic feeling we get when we see someone break their ankle. We know it isn't supposed to bend that way, so it gives us the heebie-jeebies. It was like that, but I wasn't sure why until I was 30 feet away from it. It was this coyote standing on its hind legs and was way too tall to be an actual coyote standing upright. Coyotes are the size of a very small lab, like 50 pounds, on a good day, if that. This thing was at least six feet standing. It made me feel nauseous just looking at it. It was too tall, and its face was wrong. It looked humanoid, the same way we recognize human faces as being human. I had that feeling like I was looking at a person, but it wasn't totally human. It reminded me of cat eye syndrome, but at least that is explainable. This wasn't. Anyway, I spent way too long being as close as I was to that thing as it stared at me, but I gunned it out of there and locked the hell out of my house when I got home, despite being around 20 miles away from where I saw it. I don't know what it was, but it freaked the F out to me.
and I went to bed yesterday as usual. I don't remember seeing or feeling anything out of ordinary prior to that, but what happened next was possibly the most real dream I've ever had, to the point that I'm not sure if it even was one. It all started with me waking up in the middle of the night, or at least I thought I woke up. Next, I saw a very bright, cold white light coming out the window. It wasn't focused like a flashlight would be. More as if there was a very bright light bulb, and it was getting more and more bright. At some point, I felt that my ears started ringing. I was scared shitless, to be honest, but just froze in bed and stared at the light. I closed my eyes because it was getting painfully bright, and then there's like a gap in my memory. Maybe I fell asleep, but the next thing I remember is what I would call the second part of this dream. So here I wake up again, only to see that I'm no longer in my bed, but instead lying on some kind of a table with two literal aliens standing just next to me. Here I would like to say that I couldn't move anything besides my head, and even that was pretty difficult. Also, the table certainly was a little too short for me, because my feet were dangling over the edge. Now about these beings, their skin was very pale and kind of yellowish, almost like a corpse skin would look like. They had no hair whatsoever and were completely naked. Their eyes were just sort of plain gray color and only a little bigger than regular human eyes. Their heads were bigger than human heads too, but not like in those cliché descriptions. Ears were kind of pointy and protruding out. Their height was about five feet tall, I'd say. They had very narrow shoulders, lanky arms and legs. But what stood out is that their bellies were huge. Think like a beer belly on a very fragile body. The room was well lit. The walls looked like they were made of some really dark metal, and in the corner on the right stood what I would describe as a see-through bathtub filled to the top with what looked like sausages, and to make it weirder, there were two of these aliens sitting in that bathtub and staring at me. And oh God, the stench! It felt like something had died and was rotting in there. Next, one of the humanoids standing next to me had this thing in its hands. Best I could describe it as a starfish, but it was dark brown. The alien lifted my t-shirt off and placed that starfish thing on my belly. It felt like it attached itself to me. It was kind of slimy and overall felt disgusting. Right after doing that, it left the room through the entrance that was behind me. I couldn't see where it led. The three remaining aliens just kept staring at me without saying or doing a thing. Or doing a thing, after a while, I started feeling dizzy and as if I was about to vomit. I can't tell why. Maybe it was the stench, but a few minutes after the alien came back and took the starfish thingy off me, I passed out almost immediately after. Then I woke up in my own bed. No signs of aliens anywhere. My stomach looked as if nothing happened to it, but I still felt pretty sick. I had breakfast, and in a few hours I think the feeling simply went away. I was out at my grandparents' house, hunting coyotes, as usual, this time of year. I was hiking through my next-door neighbor's land to get to the wood-covered land in the back. While I was hiking, I got the feeling I was being followed by something to my right. I stopped and switched the red tint on my headlamp to my spotlight, but didn't see anything. Then I switched back to my headlamp and pulled my rifle back up and continued my hike. It was 6.15 a.m. and the sun was just coming up. I was sitting in a hide I'd made the day before. That's when I saw something behind a group of trees on my left. It was crouched. I raised my rifle, looked through my scope, and froze when I saw the creature staring back at me. I panicked and fired a shot off. That's when it stood up and took off. Deeper into the woods. I sat there probably another 25 minutes before I decided it was safe to head in and did so. Later that day, I grabbed my grandfather, and we both went out to where I had seen the creature when it stood up on two legs and took off. We measured where I had seen it, and it was roughly seven, one-half feet tall. To this day, I'm terrified to go out at night or in the early morning hours.
I was staying at the Marriott Hotel 6th floor in Huntsville, Alabama at the Space and Rocket Center. At 5.40 a.m. on Feb 24, 2009, I went on the balcony to drink my coffee as the room was too stuffy and hot. I was out there just thinking and staring off at the woods when something caught my eye. After refocusing on it, I realized there were legs, then arms. Then I could clearly make out his face. The creature stood six, seven feet tall and was staring directly back at me. It seemed to have fine hairs all over gray color hair that got more black as the hair got closer to the skin. The tips of the hair were much lighter. The face, lips, lids, etc. were more of a very dark brown. It stood very erect, was very muscular, and did not seem to have the ape-like protruding mouth and nose, but more flat-faced human-like. After 30 seconds, he started rocking back and forth. I then realized this was moving and could in no way be mistaken for a deer or bear or anything else. This was a fully erect ape-like animal that seemed to want me see him. He was rocking back and forth from side to side. After the initial 30 seconds, he rocked for about 10-12 seconds, then stood and stared at me. I was on the sixth floor, about 120 yards away, in decent lighting due to hotel lights and street light behind loading area of hotel. He then would stare back, then he would remain face forward, with feet only about two feet apart, would lean over to his left, with his right arm would start pulling bark off a very large pine tree. It looked as if someone were in a sawing position. Then he would stand up, stare at me, then rock, and then pull bark. This was done in that order three times over a five-six minute period. After five minutes of reverifying what I was looking at, I felt this creature was docile and smooth moving. I decided I would try and get a closer look. As I opened the sliding glass door, he stared, and I stared back. I ran out of the hotel room, and there was security in our hall, laying the morning news at the hotel room doors. I asked him to come with me and asked for backup since he had no gun. We ran around the corner outside. As we were running, I finally got the nerves to tell him what I saw. We get to the reference points I had chosen, and there were a lot of fresh bark removed from the large pine tree. I tried to pull bark from it to no avail. It was too hard. I am six feet four, three hundred pounds. I went back after seven a.m. light. I did notice what looked like scat. It took the form of explosive diarrhea and looked like a hundred birds had pooped in a small area, like in a shotgun pattern, heavy in the middle and lighter to the outside perimeter. I put a large handful in a Marriott laundry plastic bag. It looks like feces and digested berries and seeds. It was dry, although it had rained the night before. One of the Marriott employees saw two large footprints, more like deep indentions in the pine straw. I took off my shoe and placed my foot in it, and there was about a one-inch area all the way around my foot in order to fill the indention. Something very heavy had to make these indentions. I tried, and I am 300 pounds and could not. I am 100% positive of the above description. I watched this clearly for five, six minutes. My encounter occurred twenty or so years ago, way before what I saw even had a name. My encounter with what you call Dogman happened one afternoon as my family and I were returning home from shopping in town. I was living in a little town in East Texas at the time, and we lived about ten solid minutes from any real signs of civilization. The town itself at the time had a population of around five hundred and it took ten minutes of dirt road driving just to get to the gas station general store. The nearest town was called Lufkin in its population, and its population at the time was around thirty-zero. We were heading home, and we were on the first part of the longest dirt road we had to travel down. There were several large hills that would make your stomach churn if you hit them too fast. We had just gone over the first one of them on our journey home. When I saw something up ahead, it at first, I thought it was a deer. It was large and brown, and was jumping over a barbed wire fence on the right side of the road. It leapt over the barbed wire fence and managed to not only clear the fence, but landed roughly in the middle of the road. This already made me perk up a little. 
as that was an impressive jump, even if it was a deer. As we got closer, whatever this was took another impressive lunge and made its way to the other side of the road, just shy of the barbed wire fence on the other side. It never stopped, but continued up the embankment. I could swear that as it propelled itself up the side, it looked back at us, over its left shoulder, as if it were deciding who what we were. Not sure. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.